go ahead and get started, guys. Are you ready for your first question? Let's do it. All righty. So, I again, you, hopefully you guys can see my screen. And if you guys have questions, please post them here. Um, first question I'm going to ask, I think, well, whoever wants to take this out of Peter, Jared, or Abhishek, uh, let me do this. So we want to export a list of events from CloudWAF for internal review, but we don't have a SIM. Is there any other method or exporting, for example, like to Excel? If not, could this be considered? This will help me relay the value uh, to my technology and leadership team. Uh, I can take that. Great. Uh, so we are actually, uh, the, the UI team is actually working on a much better reporting tool, which is expected to come in Q1 2020. At this point, we understand that the need is to report to different teams, coordinate and communicate. Uh, we do a good job by using the portal, but when it comes to have data outside, there are some formats available today. Uh, I do want to stress that SIM is the best solution because you can aggregate logs from other uh, sources and can make a more meaningful uh, insight from it. However, from the uh, portal itself, you can definitely do what it comes with the attack analytics. Attack analytics does give you information. Uh, they have beautiful insights, uh, which is much helpful in fine tuning your WAF configuration, which is much needed is how do you mature your configuration? That is where the answers come for insights. Second thing, you can take an attack analytics and create a PDF outcome. Now, uh, we understand, uh, and I want to be more open, there's need for scheduling certain reports. Uh, there are a weekly report for account that comes from the system, they have very good insights, but it it is just weekly, not on demand. So those kind of things we understand are needed and uh, we are working on, the Empower team is working on that shortcoming, shortcoming in the UI reporting that will come in Q1. But that is exactly what is going to solve the kind of questions that you asked here. What can we do outside the same from the Imperva and can report schedule or send uh, data or alerts that is where we are heading in Q1 2021. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, couple, yeah. yeah, a couple things to add that in there as well. Um, so as Abhishek mentioned, you know, as soon as we can get the data outside the system, the better, because that just opens up a world of opportunity. Um, sending the data to S3 through the SIM integration, um, I, we, we love that because effectively it just makes everything very open and you can use any other uh, query engine that you want to be able to query it. Uh, one thing that we are seeing much more commonly is people dumping the data in S3 and then using tools like AWS Athena to be able to actually go and query the data directly. Um, this means you don't actually have to send it to a SIM. Um, but at the same time, I will also say there's pretty much no reason not to have a SIM at this point, considering you can go and stand up an instance of Elasticsearch for free um, or, you know, very, very inexpensively, or even just pay some, for something like Elastic Cloud, or, you know, there's plenty of other services that have, you know, very low cost entry um, types of services. And frankly, you know, the value that we see from having it and integrating all of the other solutions, it, it's worth the time to be able to do it is probably what I would say. So, and Jared, go ahead. I was going to say just one other option that's, that's not the most graceful um, would be to use the Encapsula Logs downloader to get the raw logs, and then mm, you can do yeah. with them what you will from there. Uh, so with the Encapsula Logs downloader, it can just consume the logs, and they'll just uh, rest on whatever device you've used to download them. It doesn't have to uh, transport them to the SIM. So um, just one other third option. One more oh. thing that I forgot was the API. You can use your API to get data. There is Encapsa CLI and some GitHub tools available. Mm -hmm. These are very helpful to get data outside the portal. Uh, this is uh, very helpful when you want to report ad hoc, see original locking ad hoc. You can do it anytime you want. So just use an API and use the API automation. If you are uh, looking for something specific, uh, add those uh, requests on those GitHub tools. We'll be happy to take them. Also, you can create your own uh, reporting using using API. So if you have any tool that takes API and get ingested data to report, uh, you know it's it's there for you. So the 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 option with API are limitless. Wow, I mean that's great answers. So thank you. <laughs> um, that's exactly what I was expecting. Uh, next question uh, in CloudWAF, there's a DDoS mitigation out of the box, but can you explain the advanced DDoS setting and how to manage the threshold uh, request per second threshold effectively to achieve the best results. Oh, Abhishek, this is all you. 
Okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so I would start by saying, if the team is not aware what our advanced DDoS is, please read them. It's available on the doc site. Frankly, I would not suggest that you depend on the advanced DDoS setting to actually do what is maybe a high usage of the site. It may also match with some sales activity, some marketing campaign and things like so. What advanced DDoS basically means in the security world, it is seeing more requests that it generally sees. And you have, say, for example, default 1,000 requests per second. And if you're seeing like 400, 500 as usual, and suddenly it goes to 1,000, it says, or it means that something has changed. It does not mean it is actually a DDoS. What the system is telling you is, we expect you to be more uh, aggressive at this point when the number of requests to the site is more than you expect. And that the term advanced DDoS is actually kind of confused as a security thing. It's actually giving you an alert that it is the site is much uh, more used than it is expected. Some sites, thousand, uh, 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 the default value of 1,000 requests per second is not even uh, possible because they are actually at 30, 40, or maybe 50, 60,000 requests per second. So it depends on what you want to achieve with that value. Second thing is, frankly, I would suggest you look into some uh, in-cap rules, which is talking about site request rate which is actually the request per second for five seconds. So you can actually create a threshold, for example, uh, before it reaches the advanced DDoS, you can say, okay, at uh, say 600 requests per second for five uh, second mean, do something. Say only allow browsers, only allow specific clients that you want to do. Also, you can go a little aggressive at a little more aggressive, but lesser aggressive than the advanced DDoS at say a uh, site average request rate one minute, which is actually calculating the mean request per second per, uh, per second for a time of one minute. If you find that the average request per second actually has gone higher for more than a one minute, then do something more aggressive and you can do rate limiting, you can do some bot mitigation, you can do things. So uh, I would suggest the advanced bot DDoS is more of a challenge, which is saying, okay, I and it is and it is misunderstood that it, was, it will uh, challenge every request. It is only challenging a client which is unknown at the first request, which basically means that when the first request comes, the Empower does not know whether it is a real browser because it does not have the, uh, because it's coming safe via some other forward proxy or coming via the reverse proxy, or maybe, you know, the browser has some extension, you know, taking out or not responding to a, a, a classification request. So the advanced DDoS will only mitigate unknown. Uh, it will not be, uh, uh, you know, uh, preventing or blocking any browser or known client that it is already being able to classify. You can use uh, more in-cap rules depending on the rules below the advanced DDoS. Advanced DDoS is something where, you know, I don't care what happens, but at this rate, I can't take my application. This is a threshold where the origin will break. That is where the advanced DDoS should be used at. Don't make more requests than that to the origin. So this is where the advanced DDoS helps in challenge, uh, which is, uh, probably human-like, so like a cookie challenge or a JavaScript challenge, if your browsers uh, or other clients would be able to, uh, it will be a hidden challenge if the browser doesn't have to do it. But if you want to you know, uh, do more escalation in terms of making sure only humans can access, you can enable, it will progressively, progressively go to the capture. And you can also do what is known as uh, a bot in the bot mitigation, you can enable uh, in, that you can uh, protect against unknown client at the first request, even without the advanced DDoS setting. So these are all different ways of doing it. It all depends how aggressive you want to be, what is the threshold you want to keep. And if you want to keep more uh, aggressive uh, characteristics of uh, blocking before the advanced DDoS is picked up. I, I didn't know half of that. That's awesome. Wow, wow. So <laughs> that's, why, uh, that's why I wanted Abhishek here. I'm like, I'm gonna learn something. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> no, that's great. Before I go to the uh, next question on the community, there is a question on the chat. Uh, so Wes asks, you know, what are the plans to integrate the distilled technologies? Ah. So he has to leave earlier. Uh, yep. So I thought I'd get that asked. Yep, I, I, I can go ahead and take that one right now. Yeah. Um, so uh, you, you've seen some of it already basically um, in play today. Um, so the first step for us in terms of the integration approach was basically taking what we had from distill and getting it migrated into the proxies itself. So all of the, uh, our ability to effectively deliver all of the distilled JavaScript and everything that we need to be able to inspect the clients, um, that was integrated into the Cloud WAF proxies. And then ultimately uh, migrating from the legacy distill platform, uh, which was the, their SaaS version into the Imperva Cloud, um, that was really the next step for us. 
Um, the connector architectures, everything else that's also migrated now to the Imperva Cloud, uh, which we refer to internally as UMC or Unified Management Council. Uh, longer term, the next uh, stage and things that we're looking to do is to take the distill um, integrations and the effectively the connectors and also make it so that we can start to integrate that with SecureSphere. Um, and so the goal for us there will be to effectively use SecureSphere as a delivery mechanism to be able to inject all of the relevant distill information and be able to send that up to the Unified Management Council. So effectively, um, we're just continuing to go and take um, all of the remaining assets from Distill and just integrating them into the existing CloudWeb proxies, the Unified Management Console, um, and then also further strengthening the tools uh, and starting to, th there's other work that's gonna happen behind the scenes as well, but uh, effectively those are like the really big ticket items for us. Cool, thank you. Any other thoughts around that? Okay, good. Um, I'm going to ask Chris Richardson uh, to take his self off mute and feel free to ask your question since it's a little bit more in depth. Yeah, uh, thanks. So um, I've uh, implemented uh, uh, the Cloud WAF at some very large organizations. And one of the things that I, I run into is uh, Citrix um, environments, uh, especially with global uh, load balancers. Um, and one of the problems that we're seeing is that um, it's not working. And Citrix, basically, uh, we have to have two uh, WAF, um, uh, our two uh, environments, two cloud environments, uh, because uh, we're not able to terminate the traffic at the global uh, load balancer. And uh, I just, uh, you know, this, this, uh, I've seen, I saw this uh, earlier this year, and I wanted to see if there was anything being done about that, because then we have to have two different uh, uh, CDN, Security Plus CDN environments, and I'd mm -hmm. rather not, um, I'd rather not um, have a, a Citric WAF and an uh, Encapsula uh, WAF. Jared, uh, do you have any thoughts on this one? Yes, um, so I, I have seen configurations uh, that help to support this uh, scenario. Uh, one thing to keep in mind is that the, the Cloud WAF is, a, is for inspecting HTTP compliant traffic. So as, as soon as we start talking about uh, VPNs or remote desktop protocol, uh, your, your ch chances are it's, it's not going to work correctly. Um, what I have seen for Citrix is cases where we still protect the front door, so the login page, but once the user authenticates, uh, they are handed off uh, to a, uh, it's, it's, it requires a, uh, an additional feature uh, from the Cloud WAF called the dedicated network, um, where we're able to peel off some of that traffic, and it also requires a little bit of work on the admin side to configure a few settings, uh, but I have seen uh, mentions internally of uh, customers being configured this way and it working. Um, it, it's definitely not straightforward, so it's, it's a little involved to get it set up, but it, it can be done. Um, as far as future rollout, um, that would be a question that we'd have to direct at our, our PM as far as uh, are, are we going to adopt um, non-HTTP uh, compliant applications um, as they do become more common. Uh, you know, things like, uh, like you mentioned, Citrix remote desktop um, especially with a lot of people working remote these days. So, All right, I, I can very much. I can add one thing. Uh, I, sorry, I didn't heard the question fully. My son came in. Sorry. One thing is when you use the uh, login page to be protected by Imperva, you can use ATO. What is the most important thing is protecting you is the username password and the MFA you're using it. If someone is trying to guess, you'd probably be able to know, see from the ATO is someone is trying to uh, 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 you know, uh, guess username password could be a credential attack. We can give you the data what usernames they are trying and you can actually match how relevant they are to your system. So it, you can understand whether this is a simple script today, uh, you know, uh, run and uh, go, or this is a targeted attack. And then you can understand how your instant response can work. Knowing what is happening depends on the data. And if you have the data with the ATO, you know what to do. So sometimes the data really helps you to understand what severity you should pick up with this kind of issues. Uh, second thing is no, working a little bit of Citrix. Please reach out to Citrix. Tell them we need this integration. When two companies bring work together, the outcome for customers like yourself would be great. So at this point, I think the best thing I would do is reach out to my Alliance team and say, okay, we need to do something with Citrix. They are a great solution. We are a great solution. Let's work together to solve what Chris asked. So that would be a separate setup 
in internally in Pava. Yeah, good point. Um, I'm going to ask the other question here on uh, the chat. Uh, we have logs forwarded from Encapsula to SIM tool Splunk. However, we do not see any fields such as policy name, severity, blocked or not blocked alerts, et cetera, like SecureSphere. Do you have future plans to have detailed logs like SecureSphere on Encapsula? I can take that. Is that question specific to the event coming from Encapsula log? Vincent? Do we have the uh, person on the call? We do. It, OK, yeah. great. So Vincent, if you want to take yourself off mute, maybe just kind of clarify, that'd be helpful. And maybe you can. Um, just to answer it on a high level, there is a field called ACT. It has 32 to 40 actions done by proxy. What you're looking into two things is what is the response from the origin, which is CN1. Now, depending on the uh, format of the data you're using. So I'm using, uh, say, uh, simple CEF. So CN1 gives you what is the response from the origin. And you can look for something ACT equal to. It gives you some 30, 40 uh, data, request pass, request cached, uh, request a security blog, and things like that. So you can definitely see what the proxy is doing, and you can measure it based on what other filter you want to create. We have seen a lot of customer using that. You can even create a complete uh, story of what is the latency using the end and start. So there's a lot of data that comes in the SIM. It may not be the best, but it is good enough to solve at least 80% of the questions that we get. What is my site doing? How do I measure them? What is the health check and et cetera, et cetera. So SIM is definitely a best place to look into. Great. Hopefully that answered, uh, Vincent. I know you have an uh, microphone issues. But Jared did also edit the uh, link. Uh, thank you, Jared. That is actually the structure of the docs and it has some examples. So look for it. That's the best answer. Thank you, Jared. Teamwork at its best. Um, <laughs> work makes the dream work. <laughs> dream work, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Again, post your questions, uh, hopefully on community. Um, I still have some questions here or post in the chat. Um, we want to hear from you. Uh, next question. I really like this question a lot, um, but what are some best practices for deploying WAF Gateway in AWS? Um, I can definitely take that one here. Um, so uh, there, there's a lot of best practices um, and ultimately like everything in AWS, it's gonna pretty highly depend, be dependent on your architecture and not just the architecture of a single application, it's more of the architecture of your organization and how you structure um, multiple accounts but some of the very basic things that we generally look to recommend are first and foremost, um, the CloudFormation templates that we provide and we automatically generate using the, the CloudFormation tool uh, or the template tool. Um, those should be thought of not as written in stone, but more as a guide. And so we strongly recommend that you adjust the thresholds and modify those to be able to meet your needs. So in terms of scale up, scale down, um, and varies that you have around that, we tend to find that works really, really well. Um, the other thing that I, I strongly recommend is that um, if you're going to be deploying across multiple accounts, uh, ultimately what you're probably going to want to do is have a, uh, a security VPC, so to say, that effectively is your, your primary front door for all of the applications and where you're effectively managing the cluster of gateways together, um, and then effectively using VPC peering between the two of those. Uh, tend to find it's a little bit better um, just because as the number of accounts that you deploy across increases, it becomes very difficult to really manage it at a very large scale. And so by having a centralized uh, VPC, what you're basically doing is you're creating your own, um, I, I guess, almost like a DMZ uh, for better or worse, um, where you're containing all of the WAF gateways itself. Uh, with new large scale and max, you have the ability now to actually scale up into, um, you know, well beyond what we could do in the past in terms of total number of MXs, um, and, or I'm sorry, in total number of gateways. And so this is what we basically would look at as being uh, a logical operation for you to be able to scale your environment accordingly. Great. Thanks, Peter. Anybody else want to add anything? By the way, if, if you have experiences as well, you know, feel free to... Uh, uh, add those on the call. Um, I'm just going to say I, I, I second uh, Peter's uh, recommendation about building a security VPC. Um, it prevents you from getting uh, pigeonholed in the future. 
because uh, mm-hmm. inevitably what happens is your WAF environment will expand. It may start out as a small project just to cover one particular set of sites or subsets of sites, but then later it will expand and you'll uh, you'll find yourself in a difficult situation at that point if you don't plan ahead. Mm-hmm. That's a good point. Yep. The, the, the other thing too, I, I just did, I didn't mention it, but um, don't be afraid to mix and match between Cloud WAF and WAF Gateway. Um, there are situations definitely where you're going to find that WAF gate or Cloud WAF is going to be a lot more flexible in these environments too. Um, sometimes it's just not possible. You might be deploying an application in mainland China, for instance, um, and WAF Gateway is a, a really great for cloud um, because effectively you're letting the application teams manage that. But ultimately um, mixing and matching is something that we see pretty common and you just look for the requirements of the projects that you're working with. Um, and that was part of the rationale why we rolled out FlexProtect because we wanted to make it easy for customers to be able to pick and choose the technology that worked best. Thanks, Jared and Peter. Next question, uh, which I always like these kind of questions. Um, what enhancements do we expect to see in the platform in the near future? Oh God, a lot. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, uh, by, by actually, the way, Peter, I, I, wanna... I would go, just quickly. We do have some roadmap uh, uh, items that uh, or calls that we've had in the past, and I'll share those over time yep. uh, and reply to that directly. So that kind of helps you kind of see what's. But sorry, go go ahead. I just wanted to make sure that that's out there too. The- yeah, I, I'll just give the, the high-level notes. Um, actually, first and foremost, even before I do that, that um, one of the really, really strongly recommend is that everyone joins a session in two weeks, um, which I believe is the Project Universe one. Mm. Um, Project Universe is effectively one of our big uh, platform revamp projects that we're currently running. Um, as Abhishek actually mentioned a little bit earlier, uh, we're massively redesigning um, everything from the home experience and the functionality. Um, some of the big themes that we're really trying to tackle there is first and foremost, just better visibility and insight into everything that you get. Um, And so really kind of looking at generally how our users have used the solutions and how they manage and uh, work with sites at large scale um, is specifically, you know, going across uh, hundreds of sites, which we have many, many customers that are doing. Um, Also some of the bigger things that are happening underneath the hood um, we're completely replatforming and re-architecting a lot of the underlying technology that we use for things like data storage. So uh, this is going to allow us to introduce features like a real-time SIM feature, which is effectively giving us the ability to uh, feed events to your SIM in much more real time. So uh, we've got some delays right now in terms of how the traffic's delivered. Um, we're gonna our, our goal right now is to have that delivered in under within a couple of minutes, basically, um, and probably even better in many, many scenarios. So these are some of the enhancements that are coming. Um, I just, I'm just going to plug the Project Universe uh, webinar because we're going to be going through everything in depth. You're going to see the new mock-ups. You're going to see examples and demos of it. Um, we're super excited. We've been working on this all year. Um, and uh, it's going to be a really, really big uh, change to the way that we work. Thanks, Peter. And I put that in um, the chat. So if, if you haven't signed up or RSVP'd, please do. Um, so any other thoughts from anybody else on that? I know it's a big question, so, um, but we'll, we'll get to see a lot of that uh, in a couple of weeks. Yep. In addition to some of the webinars that we've had around roadmap, I'll share that. We've had a Cloud WAF roadmap webinar. We've had a uh, WAF gateway roadmap webinar that kind of gives you some of the features and benefits and things like that. Um, so Shamil has uh, a question. Will we see any web app scanner integrated with Cloud WAF? I, I can definitely take that one right now. Um, so by and large, probably probably not officially. Um, if, we, if we do any integrations, it would probably be more of an open source integration. Um, and I guess uh, to explain the, the rationale behind it. So if, if we go back, um, well, many years now, uh, we previously had some integrations with uh, WAF Gateway and uh, some dynamic vulnerability scanners. Um, I think what we generally found, though, when we started to actually deploy those in production with a lot of our customers was, by and large, most of the things that the security vulnerability scanners would identify that could then easily be ported into a, a rule set um, was usually stuff that we were already blocking out of the box. 
um, and it was things that were actually already covered by the default policies. I mean, especially this is a case with CloudWAF where there's really a, a really large subset of default policies that are applied um, just by having the WAF enabled. And so uh, it, it became one of those things where, you know, you would have the scanner integrated and basically the scanner just said, just keep doing what you're doing. Um, and there wasn't really that, that level of, um, you know, granularity or customization. Now, with that being said, there is an opportunity to be able to take um, findings from more advanced uh, vulnerabilities that get identified. Uh, we frequently will work with organizations where they've done things like a manual penetration test and the manual penetration test has found some vulnerability. And then we go in and write a, a rule to be able to specifically go and mitigate that. Um, but I tend to find that those are probably more common uh, for manual penetration tests than they are from scanners itself. Um, and Jared Abishek, I know you guys have some, some experience in this scenario as well, but that's just generally um, at least my thoughts and my experience working with it. Um, so it, it's not something that's actually honestly very high on our priority list. Yeah, one of the things that we can do is, again, it falls on the same solution. And why? The attack analytics can give you the information of the CV attached to an attack. You could run a coalesce if you're able to import that JSON data in or whatever the form of the data is in the uh, in the uh, same, and you can correlate of the open risk that you are seeing and the CV of what is being attacked. Of course, uh, it depends on your configuration, whether in uh, are you in block mode or uh, open mode. That is where it helps you to fine tune the services. So, uh, I think from a uh, from a perspective of a customer, it's very important to know what is the risk. It's very important to know is it closed. Sometimes it's a, a race, and when you are in a race the time is against you. And that is where you're trying to figure out, okay, there's a new CV that came out. Is, is it protected? Uh, and my discussion with the uh, with the VP of the product management is they want to create a, a new uh, uh, RSS, which will give you what are the new uh, protection has come up. It is in some phase of development, but uh, I see Uzi is here. Uh, he's the PM for the attack analytics. He is the best who is listening here. So I think we have the right audience. This is the right way of expressing your frustration and we want to listen to you and make sure it's not natively integrated. But yes, there is a need. And I think it is a very, very good ask because you want to see what is the risk? What is the priority? Of course, don't depend on CVSS and other third-party rating doesn't mean anything because you're not your system is not Oracle where the attack is Oracle. So have a context, have a tag in your SIM. This is an attack for a... So I think the best answer to here is to have some tagging and to see how relevant you are. Uh, the follow-up question is, if we can see the CV within the CloudWAF, how do we then or do virtual patching with the CloudWAF? The best uh, thing with the CloudWAF is everything is managed. We have so many good guys uh, working behind the system that they monitor the internet, they see the threat, they see their tools, they reverse engineer it and put a, a, a thread into it. I think, as I said, what you're trying to figure out is, am I protected? How do I measure it? So, uh, we do provide in the logs a file, uh, depending on your uh, same, a file type equal to some value. That value is kind of internal to us. I think it is, should be opened in some form so you can see, okay, this is a CV and this is what is a protection. So the need is, am I protected or not protected? It's a very big question and need to be answered immediately. You don't have to create a support ticket. Uh, again, I would fall back to UZ and O's who are the right guys to answer this because this is a common question of here. Uh, the third follow-up question is, can we map CloudWAF to Metre attack and uh, framework? There has been little focus uh, on Metre on the web application, mostly are on the SaaS, mostly are on the uh, Linux and the privilege escalation or the uh, local uh, privilege, you know, mostly on the system side, say mobile or the OS. Yes, there is a framework uh, working up. There has been a lot of discussion internally. Uh, how do we match them? There is some framework available within the system. It's not the official because the framework itself is uh, changing, or I would say is, is not mature enough for us to do. But if you're looking, so we generally, rather than ending up into an uh, attack framework, which is more of a uh, coordination between blue, purple, and uh, uh, red team, we are mostly on the offset uh, protection, I think. Peter here has done a great uh, webinars on API and, and the WAF, and he matches all those OS web top 10 protection for Impova. Uh, those are some of the things that we do. From a perspective of Metre, it is still not that mature for the WAF. So we do have some framework internally, but not exposed to the external world. 
the the one thing on on miter in particular um i mean for, first and foremost i just want to say we, we we love the attack framework i mean i, I love the way the the rationale be behind putting a framework in place to really go and manage and respond to threats i think it, it's it's brilliant it was long overdue in the industry um we've seen a lot of movement from the sim vendors in terms of making this a core part of their stack and their solution um, I know uh, RSA this past year, I mean, you couldn't walk down the hall in RSA without getting slapped in the face, uh, slapped in the face with the MITRE attack framework. It was, it was awesome. I was actually really happy to see that. Um, so one of the things that we generally would recommend then is that it, using your SIM is really kind of the common point for dealing with that is really the, the core focal point. Now for us with things like attack analytics, um, we, we specifically added the enhancements earlier this year to start exposing more CVE information as well as being able to link back to the, the CVEs. Um, that's really where we really kind of see the, the tie-in for um, application security threats is really uh, tying it back to more of the CVEs or the CWEs in instances where it's not actually a, uh, it's a custom vulnerability. So, um, but luckily, if there's anything that we're missing, if there's different things that you guys want to see, the one thing I also want to just say out here is um, user voice is the way to uh, best um, message that out. And the reason because as soon as you post it in user voice, um, user voice then lets other people effectively upvote those things. And then um, that gets the attention of our product managers and everyone. And, and as Abhishek mentioned, one of our product managers for Attack Analytics is on the call right now, which is awesome because he can't pretend like he didn't hear any of this conversation now. <laughs> <laughs> you you <laughs> anyway. Does he want to protect himself right now or say something? No, I'm just joking. <laughs> um, so user voice is um, your way to go in and uh, add uh, feature requests uh, and those kinds of things. So you just log in. I put the um, URL there. Uh, so we do have another question. Uh, will there be any developments in this type of WebSocket policy in the future, one. And then two is, does the 14 version uh, of WAF have any major functions planned to be launched? Jared, I know you're ready for this one. Uh, yeah, so so the first one, uh, I have not seen any uh, mentions of WebSocket uh, enhancements on the roadmap. Uh, it doesn't mean they're not there or won't be there. I just I just haven't seen them myself. Uh, for the second one, um, major changes or features that are coming to version 14, uh, advanced bridge is a big one. Um, so if you're familiar with the WAF uh, deployment types, you have uh, sniffing mode, KRP, which is kernel reverse proxy, and then you have bridge mode. Uh, on top of bridge mode, you can also run TRP, which is transparent reverse proxy, which is a requirement in order to decrypt uh, Diffie-Hellman ciphers. Uh, so where you uh, can kind of run into some problems is there's limited support in TRP for cipher sets. Uh, KRP supports much more ciphers, uh, but it's also uh, a, an entirely different deployment scenario. scenario. Um, so KRP operates at layer three and bridges at layer two. Uh, so one of the exciting things is advanced bridge mode uh, essentially brings the same level of support that KRP offers for ciphers into TRP. Uh, so a lot of the the cipher negotiation issues will will go away, and it'll be more much more straightforward. So today, when you're looking at cipher support in the docs, you have to make sure you're looking at at specifically TRP. So you have to pay attention to those asterisks that you'll see uh, in the docs page in the future. Uh, essentially, if KRP supports it, then TRP will support it as well. Um, the other things that are coming, uh, and Peter kind of uh, touched on this earlier, was advanced bot integration with SecureSphere. WAF, um, as well as HTTP2 support. Uh, so I know that's been around for quite a while. If you guys have probably seen it in the UI, it's been in beta for quite some time now, uh, but but that's starting to gain traction uh, to have full-fledged full support for that. So th those are kind of the big things that are coming for uh, yeah. on-prem WAF. Two things, uh, to go back to that first question, I did talk to the uh, product manager this morning, uh, CJ. So we, I tried to do some homework before. So thanks for posting that. Uh, he said on the WebSocket piece, we do support JSON. Uh, and in regards to the version 14, um, he actually, in June, um, he presented on the roadmap for WAF Gateway. I will post that uh, in, in, and there's a PowerPoint to that as well. But he did say he's going to be updating that PowerPoint uh, 
here in the near future to show some of that stuff. So hopefully that will help. Um, anybody else on that topic? Good, okay. Uh, there's another question. Uh, can we currently map attack analytics to uh, OS, uh, OSWAP top 10? The OWASP top 10, yep. OWASP, um, yeah. Yeah, so that, that's a really good question um, and kind of follows along with the similar theme earlier. Um, so we're showing CVEs. We're not currently showing um, any sort of mapping back to the OWASP top 10. Um, uh, you can roughly group them, but it's, it's more of a manual process. Um, uh, currently today, we can't, uh, we can't show it directly in there. Um, I think that's probably a great enhancement that we should probably make. And I'm just saying that out loud because we've got the product manager on the call. So, um, but again, I think it's something, um, we just log it as a user voice and, uh, then we can go ahead and prioritize accordingly from there. Um, but it absolutely makes sense, especially now when we see that it's not just the OWASP web top 10, but we also have the OWASP API top 10, um, and different classifications of vulnerabilities that are starting to apply now. So, um, it, it's getting harder, I think, for a lot of organizations to prove that they are secure against those vulnerabilities when auditors and people ask them specifically about it. Yeah, thanks, Peter. Um, any other questions? So I have one that uh, uh, folks have asked, and, and maybe this is a, a Jared one because he slightly mentioned it. How do, how do you handle DHE ciphers on on-prem? You're on mute. My apologies. Uh, so if you're in KRP mode, um, it, it, it won't be an issue. Um, if you're in bridge mode, then you have to enable TRP support. Uh, so the good news is, is that TRP uh, is just a checkbox to enable in the UI. There's no reconfiguration of the platform. Um, I, I see a lot of cases where um, Customers will, you know, they upload the certificate, so they, they think all is good. I, you know, I have the certs, I can decrypt the traffic, uh, but that's not not always the case. It it also depends upon the cipher set that's in use. So it's important to look at your logs under monitor monitor and alerts and look for any SSL untraceable sessions. Um, anything related to that means that we we can't decrypt that traffic, so we can see it, but we don't know what's inside of it. Uh, so ideally, you would not have any of those types of events in your your logs on prem. Um, if you do, you want to track those down. Um, if you, when you click on those alerts and you look to the right, you'll you'll be able to pick out real quickly if it's using uh, Diffie Hellman because it'll have a cipher suite with DHE in the name, and that means you you need to enable TRP. Um, however, uh, don't don't go enable don't enable TRP haphazardly uh, because it is a a true proxy at that point. Um, so we are we are terminating the connection and reinitiating on the back end. Um, and depending upon what's what's running through bridge mode, so uh, kind of along the lines of the question we had earlier, so for example, Citrix, uh, any type of VPN traffic, remote desktop traffic generally does not like to be terminated. Uh, so don't 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 enable it during the middle of the day. Make sure you do your homework and you know coordinate with your teams before turning that on. Um, the, the last important thing uh, before you turn that on is make sure that the SSL certificates that you have uploaded contain the full trusted chain. Uh, that's the other gotcha that'll that'll get you a lot of times. Uh, since we are terminating the the traffic at that point, we present the certificate to the client. So if it's missing the chain, the client will get a warning uh, and not trust the certificate. So uh, unfortunately, there's no way currently to see if the the certificates that you've already uploaded have that chain. So I recommend uh, it's a little bit more work, but just to be on the safe side, unless you're in a change control window to um, go ahead and grab a new SSL certificate, confirm it has the chain and then upload that. Uh, Cause you can have multiple certificates uploaded simultaneously uh, within the WAF gateway. And then you can choose the new one for your TRP configuration. Thanks Jared. Um, I'm gonna skip the question I just asked in the chat. I'm gonna go to Chris's, the other Chris's uh, question. So what are the top 10 support issues that customers have have with uh, WAF? Ten is a lot, so maybe we can maybe the top three or four would be fair. Abhishek, this is all you. Thanks, Peter. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the answer here is there are two things. One, it depends on the deployment what you are trying to protect. Sometimes, uh, you know, it could be specific to the application that you are trying to uh, integrate with. So say, for example, Salesforce. So Salesforce probably needs a very uh, separate configuration. Uh, 
uh, than a usual website because of the host headers pass uh, as a C name to the origin. However, the top 10 issues that I, I would say top three, I would say something which is limited to the UI. For example, you cannot change TLS or the ciphers uh, for a site. It has to be done via support. I think we are working on uh, moving them. One of the biggest thing that we have done is moving the backend configuration to UI. So there is a new delivery option or a caching option you will see. There are a lot of new features added, which were all backend configuration via support are moving to the UI. So still, there are so much configuration. I don't know many, sometimes it's just new to me, are still there. But uh, that is, I believe, is the most uh, top 10. Second is SSL. Sometimes the SSL expectation is, I enable the SSL, it should come right now. Uh, we are not the CA provider. We indicate with the CA provider, which is Global Sign, and they are uh, doing their own process. The process may take up to 24 hours. So to reset the expectation, if you are enabling SSL on the Empower, please ensure that if you need it right now, use a custom certificate. If you, if you need for Empower to support non-SNI, have a set expectation of 24 hours unless it goes to an extended validation, which requires a phone call and approval of who you are, what you and why you're using it, something like that. So the SSL probably is the so the first one is the SSL cipher, second is SSL certificate. The third, I would say, is the configuration that cannot be done. For example, you want to create an cap rule with a uh, regex. We do not allow the users to use regex because it may be a penalty of performance of a system. We do it via support call. So it's not that, uh, understand this is a SaaS service. It's not an on-premise solution where you can do everything because you own it and you do it. Because a SaaS service, there's some limitation in how you operate it and how we want you to operate. So these are some of the things. Uh, one of the other things that we have seen is the support ticket is I did not get an alert. Please in, ensure that you have a proper notification in your system. Understand what are the different notifications that come and go. And if you find that they are not done, uh, raise a feature request. We will make sure that you have, uh, you know, if there is a need for it, we will definitely add a feature request. But eventually also use SIM because most of the data that you are trying to get as an alert is in the SIM. The SIM, depending on pull, push or push function that you're using, could have a five to 10 minutes delay. We are working uh, to have a near real time, which is a very, very uh, good approach from Imperva to help our customers and you can get more uh, alerts out there. So I would say these are the three, four top, uh, I, I would say uh, limitations on the UI or the SSL that currently we are trying to expose uh, are the support tickets. Mm -hmm. uh, also, uh, please make sure you have an access to the status page. Uh, make sure you know what's happening. Uh, and I think that's all. Yep. A quick, quick thought there is, uh, and, and that's a very interesting question because in 2018, before I opened up the community, the top things I was looking for at first was the top support tickets for cloud. Um, and by far, by far, I mean, from our support cases and everything else uh, was SSL certificates. So what I did is, and I posted this in the community now or uh, on the chat, is, is that the, the, when you see that link, you'll see all the support cases and questions that were asked specifically around CloudWAF certif SSL certificates. So when I say by far, uh, and I wanted the top 10, and this was probably 40 or 50% of the questions for all of 2018 support cases for cloud, so or for uh, Capsula CloudWAF. So... Hopefully that helps. Um, we do have another. Uh, Peter, did you want to add something? Sorry, just want to make no, sure. I, I, okay. I, yeah, that, that, that's. But uh, you guys, you guys hit hit the nail on the head. Okay, good. Um, so CJ has another question. Should the root uh, CA certificate be required for the full certificate chain? I can I, that. Uh, Sorry, go ahead. He, he, yes, yes. I I always recommend it, and the the vendors uh, freely supply that on their websites. So. Um, and that's just my personal view. Um, I know I, I've seen some uh, discussions over, uh, you know, if you're if you're really into optimizing to leave out the root and just the intermediates, because uh, it'll flow up to the root anyway. Um, I personally have just preferred to have the root and intermediate, uh, so that there's no questions about uh, because because the last thing you want is for your your users to uh, receive a notification that they don't trust the cer the certificate. So. Um, I guess I'm kind of old school that way and that I, I prefer to have all three, you know, the root, the intermediate and the certificate itself. Um, so th that's just my recommendation. 
I 100% agree with Jared on that one. Um, I have personally, um, actually from back from my days of being a, uh, a user of uh, the WAF and WAF gateway, um, we ran into this problem and actually saw that, you know, we had some users in some browsers where they didn't have the, the specific root CA that we were uh, presenting. And so by including the, actually, it wasn't even a WAF related issue. This was an Apache related issue, but by ensuring that the root CA was there um, and present with it, that would mean we could actually deliver the full certificate chain. Um, and the one thing that I want to say that this is especially important for is not just for uh, web applications, but also for APIs. Um, and the reason being, if you look at it from an API perspective, usually the, the root CA store that um, most applications are going to go off of is going to be different than what browsers are typically looking at. And so while browsers might be really good at doing this, um, for APIs, it might be a, kind of a mixed bag. You have no idea what the client that's implementing the API is actually going to be using. And so this just, just provides you with that ability to satisfy the full certificate chain. Also to verify uh, how the client will react, you can uh, create a site only with server certificate without intermediate and CA and run a SS wireless. It will tell you what are the intermediate and the uh, root CA certificate Good which tough. is missing and it will tag it. You require extra download. Now you are at the mercy of the client that the you expecting the browser will be doing an extra download for you. Of course, the server will chain it to whatever the download using OSCP or whatever. But as Peter said, if you're using a trust store, and the client is looking for uh, root C verification, especially for the client's uh, certificates, it will say uh, SSL handshake failure. And there is nothing you can do because, uh, you know, uh, you do not, because most of the code is used as a community. You're not making your own code to change the behavior of the SSL handshake to fail. Of course, you can do it, but then again, uh, what is the use of the CA certificate? Great answers. That's a, that's a good one. Uh, CJ, you know, so far you guys haven't stumped, uh, stumped these guys. So keep your questions coming. We have about seven minutes. Uh, so if you have a burning question, please ask, post it. Um, now we do have one question that I didn't get answered yet, but, uh, and I think Avishek or I think that's probably the best person to answer it, but what are the recommendation, recommended steps for performing a self-service health check of your cloud WAF deployment? Uh, very good question. I hear it all the time. And when I ask a customer, what do you mean by a self-service health check? Uh, they would give me six questions or six more details. I think the focus here should be how to measure and, uh, uh, you know, if there is a deviation, how to alert. So first of all, I, I think my favorite answer is review the alert from the SIM. And SIM needs data. What do you mean by data is because you don't know whether this is good or bad because you don't know the history of the application. Are you expecting client uh, handshake to fail all the time? It could be because it's an API and just resets because of the idle timeout or whatever the reason is. So have data. Data gives you insights and you can create alerting out there. Review the error codes. There is a link on our uh, CloudWeb which gives us error dash codes and it gives you the SIM uh, 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 info. So you can use that to understand when the error is happening, what is happening. A simple way of seeing is, is to look uh, filter it based on the client. You may not know the client, but there's a snapshot the client can send it to you. If not, you can definitely see if it is a problem to other customers or not. Simple could be SLS handshake to the origin. Uh, other issue could be uh, post timing out because the code just changed and it is uh, having a lower uh, po you know, uh, post timeout. We have say uh, six minutes as HTTP timeout and it may need more. You know, it's easy to find what is the health check. Mm -hmm. Again, it is not a one step. It is continuous process because the code is also changing all the time. So if you expect that the uh, health check that you're doing good is good after six months, it may not be because you didn't have an API and now you have API client. So it depends. Again, review the action. Are you doing a DDoS challenge for an API? It will never be able to pass CAPTCHA. It's a bad action. So always review what you're trying to do an action with respect to who the users are and what they can actually do. Now, these are some insights. Some recommendation here is create a proper monitoring for your site. Don't depend on the SIM. The best way of doing is, again, uh, uh, it is a synthetic testing. You probably need to do a synthetic testing for your site for a specific application. Could be login, reset, cart in, cart out, depending on what the application you are, or rate check, whatever the application is the most useful thing. Do it with Imperva and without Imperva. If you see a deviation that there's latency issue with Imperva, without Imperva, you know, you can cache them. 
finding a problem is more important than solving because you can't solve if you don't know what the problem is so catch the problem uh, look for site settings there are uh, alerts which comes for origin failures it could be server dc or the uh, server application look for those alerts create a specific filter in your email to say okay when no underscore replied in, in capsula.com dot com sends a request uh, email it may be thousand but you're looking for server failure so create a, maybe a filter on your inbox this 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 has to be just like a blog post in itself because like you, you've just listed like actually you've listed like 10 blog posts basically yeah this is just common uh, things and uh, there is also weekly rep uh, report that comes in for the account you can see what are the top trends happening you know attack coming in for what side bot mitigation happening things like that Another one, thing, one thing is, uh, oh, sorry, one, one thing just to jump in here um, that you didn't mention that I see wrong all the time, and we actually added uh, this into um, Attack Analytics as an insight, is um, not locking down your origin servers. Um, this is something that uh, we just, we started running manual check, uh, automated checks against it and reporting it back to users uh, with it. But please, please, please make sure your origin servers are locked. And so what that means is, you know, just putting a firewall rule or a security ACL or, you know, security group in AWS um, to be only limit the traffic to originate from the cloud WAF. Um, there's nothing worse than basically going and doing all of this work and implementing cloud WAF and everything, and then just basically leaving the back door open. So um, always check that. Um, and again, we've made this a lot easier by including this in attack analytics, but um, that is bar none, I think one of my biggest recommendations for uh, best practices. Yes, I agree yeah. to that, uh, Peter. And one of the things some uh, customers are doing, they create a alert on the SIM, which is saying if the request is not improv IP, we do publish all of our IPs. If the request to parallel to is not improv IP, what is the action? It is open, then they understand they have to block it. So SIM again helps there. Because so, you are looking yes. for a report, uh, the SIM gives you the report that the IP is not imperva and it is going to your origin for web application. Another way of doing this is automate, uh, uh, leverage API, create incident response uh, playbooks, and use X-ray uh, debugger. Because what is happening during your time is to be troubleshooted. If the problem is resolved and you don't have any logs, the chances are, of course, we will try to figure out our best to solve the problem, but we don't have enough information to solve. So data, again, plays crucial inf information of what you need to do at that time. Yep. And I'll stop here. So, so one quick thing I wanted to add on that Peter touched on. Uh, so if you don't have attack analytics, but you should, wink, wink, <laughs> uh, there is a uh, open source uh, tool called Site Protection Viewer Master uh, that's out on GitHub, and uh, it will also do bypass checks. Um, so if, if you don't have a, attack analytics, uh, you, you can check out some of the open source tools. And the best way to run that tool is you can look into the same and see what is the server port. Use all the server port. You can configure those server ports in that tool, and you can run if it is open for one specific application or all. So you can customize the port that you want to scan. Again, this is not a TCP uh, check. It is an HTTP check. So it is different than the Nmap. Can, can, I, can I vote for Abhishek doing a future webinar just talking about all the cool things you can do in a sim with all of the data that we feed into it and what he's seeing? Because like I've, I've learned so many things from you in this presentation that I didn't even know exist. So. Thank you, Chris, actually, for coordinating this. This is very helpful. Yep. And thank you to all the customers who joined because we are nothing without them. So thank you, everyone. Well, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, thank you. Okay. I like the video.